It's a great uh, pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor uh, Emery Brown here. I said at the very beginning that we have uh, many of the faculty in, uh, in, in here are from MIT or from Harvard. Here's one of the very few people who is at MIT and uh, also at, uh, at Harvard. So Professor uh, uh, Emery Brown has made uh, major contributions to our understanding of neural coding and the statistical properties of neurons, developing uh, methods uh, to study uh, uh, neuron sequences of uh, spike trains and statistics of neuroscience in general. And then uh, today uh, he's going to talk about um, uh, his other lab, his other uh, major topic where he has also uh, made uh, profound uh, uh, contributions to the field, which is the study of uh, anesthesia and, and consciousness. And so uh, I know to, uh, yesterday we briefly uh, touched upon the question of uh, consciousness. So today we have a real expert that's going to uh, shed light and, and introduce us to, to this topic and, uh, and, and the, the study of consciousness during uh, anesthesia. So it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Gabriel, thank you so much. Th thanks again for inviting me. And uh, just one clarification right off the bat. So I, I'm going to tell you about unconsciousness. I don't know much. Consciousness is hard. This unconscious, as you'll see, is much easier. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about, how anesthetics make you unconscious. So just some funding sources from NIH, from my department at Mass General Hospital, and also from MIT. So this is what I want to talk about. I want to, I want to give a little clinical look at what general anesthesia is. And then I'll talk specifically about loss of consciousness under, under propofol and a few other anesthetics. And I want to show you what happens to the anesthesia, to the brain response to anesthesia as we age. It's, 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 it's pretty interesting, and it's, uh, it gives us insight into how anesthetics might be used for some other things, too. And then I'm going to talk about closed-loop control of anesthesia and reanimation, turning the brain back on. Uh, if, there, if there's ever a, a place where there's a need to have something which is computers help us out to do this, I think it's with anesthesia, particularly for patients in the ICU. You can have patients who are in the ICU for many weeks, sometimes months, and they have to be sedated the whole time. You know, there's no way in the world a human can really control that, their level of sedation that well. So that's a, a great opportunity. So we're going to talk about where we are in that work. So these are the main points that I want to make. I don't know what sort of concept you have of anesthesia right now, but, but it's, not, it's not a static state. The brain is not turned off. It's actually quite dynamic. That's what I'm going to show you. And it it's actually generates these oscillations, and the oscillations disrupt how the various parts of the brain communicate. And, <clears throat> and that's what I just said. So... And the thing is, these oscillations are very visible on the EEG. They change systematically with the, with the anesthetic drug dose, the anesthetic class, and, as I said, the, also the age of the patient. And as I said, I want to talk about closed-loop control because one of the things that happens, particularly for older patients, patients in older doesn't have to be, you know, 80s, 90s. You know, older can be just, you know, 50s or what have you, even younger. People's brains don't work after anesthesia. So you're going to see why the drugs would make you unconscious, but you're going to also see why they would generate pathologic states afterwards. It, it, it's, it's, this, it's the edge of the, the same edge of the same sword. And then, and it's an underutilized paradigm for studying the brain, and I'll, I'll mention that briefly at the end. <clears throat> so what is general anesthesia? So it's a drug-induced reversible state that consists of antinociception, meaning loss of pain processing, unconsciousness, amnesia, akinesia, and physiologic stability. And the reversible is important because if you take those first four, those first four conditions right here by themselves, they're synonymous with death. Okay, so that's not cool. All right, all right. All right. And 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 the thing is, it, it really annoys me. But anesthesiologists love to say we have no idea how anesthesia works. It's like you know you got to be part of the club to be able to do it. You know, sort of thing. You know, you know we we, we don't we, we can't we don't know we can't tell you. Well, if you don't know how it works, you can't improve it basically. And how it does work, and I'm going to show you one way it works. This is not the only way. But as I said, one way it works is by generating oscillations. The oscillations are going to alter how the neurons spike. And with those alterations in neurons spiking, in some cases, slowing things down quite a bit. In other cases, actually slowing them down and speeding them up, slowing them down and speeding them up, you're going to, you're going to disrupt communication across the brain. All right? And so this is what we typically do. To create the state of anesthesia, we use a combination of drugs. So, for example, we use something like propofol to induce you. And then once you're on propofol, you'll maintain with either propofol or sevoflurane. So, sevoflurane, isoflurane, desflurane, believe it or not, they're all still ethers. 
We still use ether even in you know 2023. 1846, you know, was the first time ether was used in a public demonstration at Mass General Hospital. We're still using ether essentially, or ethers. Then we give you drugs like opioids, like uh, ketamine. I'm sorry, like uh, like remifentanil or morphine, or other antineptive drugs like ketamine to control pain. And then from a anti from a ability, we actually give you drugs which are we call them paralytics, but they're muscle relaxants. So you have a cocktail of drugs. Basically, you get at least 10 drugs just for you know, a simple anesthetic. So this, this is how we maintain the various states of, of anesthesia. And we then use anesthesia. Typically, the anesthetic drugs, particularly the this hypnotic drugs, the drugs that make you unconscious, lower your blood pressure. So we're usually constantly giving drugs to maintain blood pressure. That's why the hemo, I put there the hemodynamic stability. All right. So, <clears throat> so let, let me just sh show you what this looks like the EEG. So we have EEG in all of our operating rooms. So you can put four leads of EEG on all the patients that follow the state of the person under anesthesia. And this is the woman I took care of. Well, you can see it's almost about 10 years ago now. She, um, she's going to have thyroid surgery. She's about 60 years old. She weighs about 80 kilograms. I'm going to give her a standard dose of propofol. It's 150 milligrams. Just 150 milligram bolus that I'm going to push in like this. And this isn't edited. I'm just going to play it in real time. All right, so the first thing you're going to see is it's going to get really noisy. The EEG is going to get really noisy. Those are eye blinks there, though. It's going to get really noisy because when you inject propofol into a small vein like the one on the back of my hand here, it burns like crazy. So she's going to do this. She, 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 she's tensing up like this. That's what all that noise is right there. That's actually good from a pedagogical standpoint because as soon as the drugs take over, you're going to see that's going to drop away just like that. So you'll, you'll notice it instantaneously. So give it about another 10, 10, 12 seconds or so, right? So she's still really tensing up there, responding. And you can see the EMG marker sort of showing that up top, that, that purple line. Now watch right here. Beta oscillation, so she's sedated. They get deep, slow oscillations, right there. They get even deeper. She's out. She's unconscious right now, all right? And now she's going to go slow, and then burst, and then slow, and then burst, all right? So what did I just show you? No, this is just EEG. This is just, yeah, this is just, this is just four leads of scalp EEG. So, so two electrodes here, two here, and the ground and the reference in the middle. And you can put this on all, any patient that you have. It's in every room in the OR, basically. So, so n nothing intracranial. I'll show you some intracranial data in, in, in a little later on, but this is, this is just raw scalp EEG. And it makes what I think is a very important point. This is the strongest EEG signal there is, basically. For all the things that EEGs use, whether it's to track sleep, you know, do behavioral studies, look at patients in coma, um, to, um, <clears throat> you know, for, for, for whatever, this is the strongest one, because you saw what happened. As soon as the drugs take over, right, as soon as you lose the muscle artifact, which you always have artifact using EEG, and then, then what, you see, what you see occurring is that these very large oscillations. And that's what I want to give you a sense of right now. So, yeah, you, you mentioned that uh, the person gets unconscious before the oscillations start or after the oscillations start? No, no, when you saw the slow oscillations come on, that's when, that, that's when she became unconscious. In other words, so if you look, see, go from A, B, C, you saw A, B, C, then you saw, you saw D there, you saw E actually. When E came on, she was unconscious. She became unconscious. And, and, I, and I know that because um, E actually represents the effect of the drug on the brain stem. And if at that point in time we were to do a, a brain stem exam, like the neurologists do, where we turn the head, this sort of thing, or you, you check the oculocephalic reflex, her brain stem is out. So she, there's no question in my mind she's unconscious. Now, it's also acting in the cortex and at the thalamus, too, right? But she clearly has a very profound effect right then at the brainstem. All right. The, rec the recordings you see are just literally just over the, the, the frontal cortex here. That's it, exactly. Right. And the, 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 the brainstem exam, you can infer that from the EEG. In other words, you can infer it from the EEG with a little bit of science, but the clinical exam correlates very tightly with the slow oscillations coming on. In other words, when I when I check her oculocephalic reflex or I check her, her corneal reflexes, it says her brainstem is out. 
Or in other words, if I hadn't told you she got anesthesia, a neurologist would come in the room and say, this woman's in a coma. You put it that way. I'm going to go through them. Let me go through them for you. All right. So there's the first one. She's awake. So she's not, she's not out there. <laughs> she's awake. All right. Right there, that was the state where I said, you know, watch, the oscillation's got to be regular. She's sedated there. So if I wanted to anesthetize her so that she could tolerate uh, like a colonoscopy or something like that, I would just dial the propofol and hold it right at that state there. So, so those are beta oscillations, about 12 to 16 cycles per second. And then we, we skipped over D. We'll come back to D. We'll talk most about D today. But you saw the large slow oscillation. That's when I said her brain stem went out, all right? And, and th that I, I've done this a lot. I've documented that you know, a number of times. It's not just the brainstem. Let me just emphasize that. But, but the brainstem is one part of it. Then you start going to birth suppression. You've probably heard about birth suppression. It's a very deep state of, uh, it's a deep state of unconsciousness, of brain inactivation. It's not only a neurophysiologically mediated state, but also a metabolically mediated state. All right? And so very often, we actually use it on purpose. We're going to, do, we're going to actually create a state of brain state and, of, of birth suppression in rats and, and a little later on. But the other thing that happens here also is when patients are in coma, very deep coma, you'll also see birth suppression like this. So the, the, the brain is profoundly inactivated. And then obviously isoelectric between the, the, the two states. We'll come back to slow oscillation and alpha oscillations. And paradox excitation, I'll talk about that a bit at the end. But there's just a general a general kind of gestalt that I want you to get. Look at the awake state. This is this, you know, gamma oscillations. That's what you, we usually use to communicate sort of across the different brain regions. And look how they've, they've and they're about five microvolts or so. And then look at this down here. These are somewhere in adults between 20 to 50 microvolts. All right, so, and the other thing is, as you're going to see, how the neurons are spiking now is going to be quite, quite different. All right, so this is a, you know, it's, it's very hard for your brain to be transmitting information if the oscillations should be doing this and you're making them do this, basically. Let's just say it that way first. And we'll, we'll look at that in more detail in just a second. So, so this is what's happening under anesthesia. The other thing, too, is that I think it's easy to infer or get a sense of. If this is what we're doing to patients' brains every time that they have anesthesia, it's kind of like a chemotherapeutic agent. You give a chemotherapeutic agent like cytoxin, it works. It basically kills the cancer cells, but it also harms the good tissue as well. So it makes sense that if you have oscillations like this, which are, which are disrupting how the brain, parts of the brain communicate, it makes sense the effects are not going to just go away just like that as soon as you turn the drugs off. And so you can understand why your brain wouldn't work. You're, you're not going to just pop out of state D, say, in five seconds after I turn off the propofol. That's not going to happen. All right. So what we often, and this is also from the operating room. You can see this in the operating room. We have, in addition to just the raw EEG, we have the spectrogram. So you can actually do this, look at the spectral decomposition of the waves and actually see it in real time. So this is a woman I took care of, and so I'm giving her a continuous infusion of propofol now. So this is time on the x-axis down here. Time is here. This is the frequencies here. And the colors give me the, the, amount, the power, basically, in the various frequency bands. And so we turned on the propofol here, gave her a bolus, and started an infusion. And as we run the propofol, we actually see two, uh, two bands which are very strong. There's a 10 hertz band, which you can see. See the higher frequency oscillations there? And then the slow oscillation band, slow delta oscillation, about 0.1 to about 4 hertz that we saw before. This is classic propofol. Young person, 18 to 35, you give them propofol, this is what you're going to see. And then you turn the propofol off over here, right, somewhere in here. The oscillations break up, and she wakes up over here, all right? So this is, this is, so in addition to looking at the raw EEG signal, like I'm showing you above, we can also look at the spectrogram. And this helps us understand what state the person's in under anesthesia, all right? So these are my colleagues that I've done this work with over the last few years. Patrick Purden, who just moved to Stanford. Chinung Ching, who's at WashU. Maud Eskandar, neurosurgeon, who's at, down at uh, Einstein. Eric Pierce, who's at, who's at MGH. Um, anesthesiologist Laura Lewis, who is one of our PhD students, who's now back at MIT on the faculty. Nancy Capel, very well-known um, mathematician, who's helped with a lot of the modeling of this work. And Sid Cash, neurologist at MGH. All right. One last little bit of phenomenology, then we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit about mechanism. All right. <clears throat> so you were asking before whether we had intracranial data. So this is an intracranial data. This is surface EEG over the, over the entire head, so 64 leads. So these are 44 of 64 leads. And what I'm going to show you 
is the spectrogram at these at 44 locations simultaneously. All right. And what we're going to do is we have volunteers who come and let us anesthetize them. So, like next Saturday, if you're not doing anything, you know, just drive out by, you know, free sleep, you know. No, no, no. The, the, uh, I can wake you up, I, I promise. No. no. We're going to give this person increasing doses of propofol like this, all right? Increasing. And every dose we're going to hold for about 14 minutes. So it's going to take a little over an hour to get up to the maximum and then about a little over an hour to come down, all right? And so this up here, this is the front, this is the left ear, this is the right ear, and this is the occipital region back here. So let me just remind you of something which you probably remember from like your neuroscience class. If you close your eyes like this and you put electrodes back here on the, on the occipital area, you get the eyes closed alpha oscillation. In fact, that's what you know, electroencephalographers often do to check to make sure the like, EEG machine is working. They see, can you produce an eyes closed alpha? So this is a person here. This, this is a guy. He has his eyes closed. So he's generating eyes closed alpha. And one of the really cool things about anesthesia is that this eyes closed alpha oscillation as you become move, move into deep, de deeper depths of anesthesia, it migrates from the back of the head, concentrates in the front. As long as you keep the infusion running, it stays concentrated in the front. Then when you turn it off, it migrates backwards. So it, in addition to there being a temporal dynamic to the EEG, there's a spatial dynamic. And this was first pointed out by John Mitchenfelder and John Tinker, who are two anesthesiology researchers at the Mayo Clinic back in 19, 1977. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play this video here. And if you watch right here, this is the, so nothing's being given. And you'll see the different drug levels that were, target levels that we're trying to achieve over here. And the highest level is gonna be five. So let me, let me just play the video. All right, so nothing yet. Now, now the drug starts. Now you see how, see how the oscillation in the back breaks up? So that appears in the front. We're not even at the highest level yet. We're at three, and look, it's, it's very strong, totally unconscious. Each level is about, four, about 14 minutes. And here's five, five is the deepest level. Now watch what happens as we turn the drug off. It disappears in the front and reappears in the back, okay? So, so not only is there, is there a temporal dynamic to this, but the spatial dynamic of the oscillations is quite different, and it affects the different... I mean, the, the brain is not uniformly connected across all regions, so it makes sense you, you, you could read a little to infer that you'd have sort of a different dynamic. So let's talk a little bit about, about mechanisms. So we can... So I, I didn't say this before. Propofol works by enhancing GABAergic inhibition. All right. So GABAergic interneurons are everywhere throughout the central nervous system. So in the cortex, and really throughout the central nervous system. But there, there are three areas that I just want to put emphasis on. One is the cortex. The second, which I really, I, this is an old slide, I apologize, I didn't have it drawn here as well. The other is the thalamus right here. Because remember in the thalamus, so if this is your thalamus, the thalamus sends projections to sort of all parts of the cortex like this, but it has a net around it like the reticular thalamus. And that reticular thalamus is an inhibitory network. So it gets, the, it gets to modify every output that goes out of the thalamus going up to cortex or what have you. And so if you now, and it's GABAergic, it's a GABAergic network. So if you give GABAergic inhibition, you're going to grossly in, impair the ability of the thalamus to sort of send that sort of information up to cortex. And then the other pathway, which you may be a little less familiar with, it's right here. See, see this red, these red lines here? This is the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. It's kind of like my wrist. So this is the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, and it has inhibitory projections which come out and hit each one of the major arousal systems. So like the dorsal raphe, the locus ceruleus, like the cholinergic centers, and all of those pathways are GABAergic. All right. So remember when I said when when I saw the slow oscillations come on, the woman was unconscious. So and that's because. When propofol comes into the brainstem, it comes right through here. There's the basilar artery that passes right along here. And then it hits these, these inhibitory networks right here, and it goes, oh, wow, thank you so much. This is so cool. Just what I need. And it, and it, and it just takes these, it just takes them. Psh, psh, psh. That's why you saw this very dramatic change all of a sudden, just this slow oscillation just sort of came out of nowhere. That's the effect there. Now, at the same time, 
blood is getting everywhere, so it's also getting to the cortex and thalamus as well. Question? Yeah, I, just to clarify, like uh, the, pro, the propofol, it's an agonist on the GABA receptors? Exactly. Okay. Right. And it, so it, it enhances inhibition. Right. All right, so we have this little mental image. We have this, which I, which I can see in the operating room. All right. And now, so, and we just saw this. We just saw this alpha oscillation concentrate in the front of the head. And the one thing which I didn't say about it is highly coherent. In other words, if you were to measure the actual coherence, so you t pick a frequency and measure the correlation between two sites on the scalp in the front at that, at, let's say, the alpha frequency, the coherence is 0.8 or 0.9. It's amazingly strong. So this is one of the things that, with the help of Nancy Coppell, led us to consider that this might be a, um, this might be something which is being mediated by the thalamus, all right? And so that's what our, not only Nancy's models have actually shown us, I don't have the data on that here today, but we've also done experiments in, in uh, rats where we stuck electrodes in the, corte in the cortex, in the thalamus, and actually demonstrated there's a 10 hertz oscillation going back and forth between the two. All right, that, 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 that's, that's this part here. And, and it looks something like that. So that alone, in other words, if, you, if you, you're, you're up here gamma most of the time, or that's where you're supposed to be, and now what I do is I put you at, let's say, 10 hertz, that alone is going to have a very strong disruptive effect on cortical processing, that thalamocortical processing, just that by itself, all right? But... Let's talk about the slow oscillations, because there I can actually show you direct human data. So these are data from, uh, so, so these are intracranial data. So these are data from Laura Lewis's PhD thesis. And she did a very straightforward experiment, which was patients who have epilepsy get electrodes implanted. You know, they stay in the hospital for five to seven days off medications, then they come back to the operating room to have the electrodes removed. And so when they come back to the operating room to have the electrodes removed, you have this really unique situation. You have a human that has electrodes in there, and our neurologists um, implant, so recording electrodes, so we can record not only the field potential, they also get spiking activity. So you can see the field potential and the spiking activity of, these, of the person there. And so that's what I'm showing you here. So these are, these are field potentials here, and they correspond to these sites here on the surface of the, on the medial temporal lobe. And here's a neuron. This neuron is sitting next to the red electrode. So it, you can see it's spiking sort of irregularly, just sort of as you'd expect, sort of what we call, quote-unquote, dyssynchronous spiking, let's say. Now, let's contrast that after they've gotten the bolus of propofol, and look what happens now. See the large, slow oscillation? Now the neuron spikes now. It spikes now. It spikes now. So every two seconds or so, all right? And... I can't tell you what the rate has. So when the, when, the, when the person's awake, the spike rate's about 10 to 12 spikes per second. This is about one to two spikes per second. I can't tell you what the cutoff is, what, what the rate has to be. But I can submit to you this person here is profoundly unconscious. All right? All right. So to look at this better, we've, we've also done this now in non-human primates. So this is work we've done with Earl Miller at, at Mass General and also Jake Donahue. This is part of Jake's PhD thesis. So exactly the same experiment. But now the cool thing with the non-human primates is you can put electrodes pretty much wherever you want. So this is four areas. So two frontal areas, so 8A, so frontal eye fields, prefrontal cortex, and then two sort of more posterior areas, posterior parietal cortex, and the superior temporal gyrus, or the auditory area. So each one of these, so, so, so these are the field potentials here when the, when the, when the animal's awake, the non-human primates awake. And here are the corresponding spiking activity. So, so this is a so that you can see the very low, sort of very, sort of highish frequency oscillations, low amplitude, and here's the spiking activity, 10 to 12 spikes per second. Now look at the slow oscillations over here. Now you can see that not only is the, are the oscillations, do you have these kind of, for want of a better word, up-down states, but what you also see is they're, they're kind of like strips across the cortex. So you've got these large barriers, these large interruptions. And then the, the important quantitative factoid is now this neuron is spiking at one half to one, the neurons are spiking at one half to one spike per second. All right. So I'd submit you're, this person's unconscious. All right. So why am I on about this? Why do I keep repeating the same thing? So we've, for a number of years, known the sorts of things that I'm telling you about. And we've been trying to train our, and so this is, 
So if anything I've said is remotely correct about what the alpha oscillation is doing, what the slow oscillation is doing, so if, if what I said is correct about the humans or about the non-human primates, when my anesthesiology colleagues see a GABAergic anesthetic and they see these slow oscillations here, they can feel pretty comfortable that the person is unconscious. All right? And everybody, but most of my colleagues sort of across the United States don't use the EEG at all. In fact, only about 25% of them do. Yet people are always worried about whether someone's going to be awake under anesthesia. So what do you do as a consequence? You're not using anything like this. You just overdose people. That, that, that's what happens as a consequence. Question? The reason that you see the high frequency modes disappear, but for some reason like this lower frequency, I mean, the, I mean so the, the very high frequencies, but then there's like the specific frequency which gets amplified. How does it happen like on a biochemistry level? So, so, so the, um, <clears throat> so, so, so there, there, there are two things that are happening here. So one is Nancy has made these what she calls I to E models, this is, so the back of the envelope explanation. So, so inhibitory, so net, cortical networks that are made of inhibitory, inhibitory and excitatory neurons. And she's basically shown that as you, if you just, just simply applying inhibition to networks like that will drop the frequency of the oscillation. So that, that she's established. And then the other thing is propofol or the, or the GABAergic drugs induce hyperpolarization, right? So in other words, they actually drop all, so, so you can think of all the membrane potentials sort of like going down basically together. And depending on how much drug you give, the, the larger and larger the dose you give, the more effect you're going to have on those membrane potentials. So that's what we think is actually, is actually occurring. And there are a few other details which they've just, she just put in a paper which we wrote about, about two or three months ago. But, but that's what we think is happening. In other words, this, in, this inhibition is actually, is actually causing this very global hyperpolarization of the cortex. For specific frequencies. So the slow oscillations, I would, the, the slow oscillations are easier to explain because if you go back to this work done by Frederick Breme back in 1939, uh, 1935, he actually showed that if you take away, if you take away brainstem inputs, if you take away brainstem inputs going up to cortex, you will actually see slow oscillations in the cortex. He did that in cats by, by, by sort of transecting, the, transect, separating, the, separating the brainstem from the, the cortex. All right. So that I can give you. It takes a little more modeling work to actually show why the alpha oscillations come about, and that's a thalamocortical oscillation. That's what our modeling work has shown. And, we, and, we, and then we've, 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 we've demonstrated that empirically. It's a specific time scale on which these GABA uh, receptors are inhibited, and you get some sort of resonances between the two areas you showed, the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus, and this, this might be related to the reason why you get these kind of frequencies surviving. And very very, are, very possible. Ones, no? for, for the alpha oscillation, right? For, for the alpha oscillation. I think that's, that's very possible. In fact, that, that, that idea is, is roughly a part of this, this, this model, basically. In other words, that the um, you <clears throat> the model shows two things. It shows that you can generate the alpha oscillation in the cortex, but also shows you can generate the the alpha oscillation in the you hyperpolarize the cortex sufficiently enough, and then it has a hyperpolarizing activating current, which actually comes back at alpha. The alpha in the thalamus couples with the alpha in the prefrontal cortex, and now we get the resonance between them. All right. It's different posteriorly. Remember, remember, you saw it disappeared. The connections going posterior to the posterior are quite different. So, so you don't you don't get the resonance there. So you're right. It, it, th that concept does underlie it. So I'm trying to get my anesthesia colleagues to use this because we think it would help them. More importantly, it would help the patients. But it's hard to do because if you've practiced in a black box fashion for 30 years, you're not going to change your habits. So this is this is. It's, it's frustrating, let me just be frank. So this is what I've just shown you. We've talked about the coupling between the thalamus and the cortex. I've shown you the slow wave oscillation. I've shown you the anteriorization. And I've mentioned this idea about, about the brainstem. All right, so this, this, is, this is how we think propofol makes you unconscious. But this isn't everything. There's also a very strong metabolic effect. And there's a whole other little set of other channels that it's also getting. This is just the GABA story. 
but it's also getting the HCN, the HCN2 channels. So, so this is part of the story, but I think this is probably the major part of the story of how it's working. So you were suggesting um, that you really think um, EEG should always be used uh, in practice, and uh, so the main reason would be to um, ensure that this uh, interiorization mechanism uh, did happen, um, and the yeah the patient is not uh, awake unbeknownst right. to the doctor. Right, exactly. I mean, so let's just think about it. if if it with, without without any EEG on, you're just looking at the person, and at some point they stop responding. Um, and the question is, are they unconscious? You, you know, you tap them a few times, this sort of thing. Go, okay, looks like he's okay. And you start administering the other drugs or what have you. You have no information coming back directly from that person's brain saying that he or she's unconscious. And the information which you could get from that person's brain is actually very, very strong. And it's not used. That, that, that's, that's my point. And so, so, in other words, and I think the upside, particularly for older patients, we'll see in a second, it takes just homeopathic doses of anesthesia to anesthetize most older patients. Even smaller doses than people appreciate. And so, and who do you think gets most over, over sedated or over anesthetized? It's older patients. And I, I have a lot of older patients who come to me and go like, you know, doc, uh, you know, I'm really afraid about that anesthesia because I'm afraid my brain's not going to work. Is it going to be okay afterwards? And you know, I'd love to tell them 100%. Yeah, it's it's, it's going to be. But I'll tell them I'll do the best. I, I'll do the best I can. I'm I'm going to be watching your brain very carefully and only giving you the just the amount that you need, essentially. That that that's the reason, because short of short of um, uh, the monitoring, the anesthesia is always going to err on the side of giving you more because everybody's paranoid about someone being awake under anesthesia and then not, and then then not knowing it. Do you have an understanding about like what happens in those cases when someone is not uh, responsive to the drug and so they just stay away, like they don't um, go into an unconscious state? I can honestly tell you, I've had the good fortune of doing this for 30 years. If I give enough, you're going out. <laughs> well, then, yeah. Why some people's brains are just so resilient to the drug and well, I'll tell you one. I'll tell you. More? I'll tell you one little quick story. So, I was taking care of this gentleman who was having he was having knee arthroscopy. He's a rather big guy like this. You know, he sat, always had a smile on his face like this, like he's always pleased with himself. You know, sort of thing. <laughs> and and so we, I was, I was helping one of the young residents. And this is going to be a short surgery. It's about 30, 30, 40, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And so I push in, you know, the standard dose of propofol, which is about 200 milligrams. He's, I gave him more because he was bigger. And he's just still there, just smiling. <laughs> and I looked to make sure that it actually, you know, wasn't running on the floor or something like that. And, and, it, and it wasn't. And, and I'm trying to be cool because I have no idea what the hell is happening. And I'm, I'm there with the resident, right? And so, so I push another half, and I push another full syringe. So normally, three quarters of one syringe is enough for pretty much everybody. I pushed two syringes in this guy, and he finally went out. And then it took forever. I had to keep the anesthesia, the, the gas, I was using gas at the time, I had to keep it at the highest level to keep this guy out. And, and I was glad when that surgery was over, let me tell you that. That, that was totally stressful. This was before using EEG. All right. But not that EEG would help me because I was giving him mega doses and he was still, he was still awake. So I, when, he was, when he was back in the recovery room, I said, did anyone ever tell you like, you're hard to anesthetize? It takes a lot of drug to anesthetize you? He goes, uh, no, but you know, maybe it's because I'm, I'm self-administering Ritalin. I said, dude, I wish you had told me that before I, I anesthetize you. I mean, so he's, he's actually giving himself a stimulant, right? So I'm having to counteract not only his normal physiology, his normal neurophys, but also the fact that his brain is, his frontal cortex is probably highly activated because of the Ritalin. So that, 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 in that situation, you know, yeah, that, that was wild. That was stressful for me. <laughs> Important advice for all of us on Ritalin before. Right, yeah. Please tell your honesty. Well, but actually, you know, most of the times when patients come to the OR, it's like a confessional. Like, Doc, you know, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. They'll, 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 okay, that's, I said, I'm glad you told me. It's good. They give it up to the anesthesiologist, I'll tell you. Yeah. 
So this is very important. General anesthesia is not sleep, all right? So I showed you these oscillatory patterns that we have under general anesthesia, which are these over here. And this, as you know, is sleep. So you go through these four stages. So, you know, non-REM, one, two, three, and then you pop up to REM. This is more like an awake state. You know, the brain is very active. You're, it's doing some work, probably. And here, a slow wave stage is probably, it's probably, um, it, it's, it's probably resting, all right? And on, superficially, these oscillations here might look like these are the states we have someone in that when they're anesthetized, but they're actually quite different. The dynamics in the brain are quite different. And that's what we've just been, we've just been talking about. It's, we, we have a bad habit as anesthesiologists. You know, we say to patients, you know, Mr. Jones, you're going to go to sleep for your surgery. You know, I can't say, Mr. Jones, I'm going to put you in a drug-induced reversible coma. Don't worry, I can wake you up, right? You know, he'd hop off the table, right? But what I do is I say to the patient, I say, look, you're going to be unconscious. You won't, you, you won't feel any pain. You know, you won't remember anything that happens. And, and you won't be moving around, so it'll make it easier for the surgeons to operate. And I'll wake you up once, we, once we're done. I give them a definition of general anesthesia. I don't use sleep as a metaphor. It's, it's a very bad metaphor because it's not, it is not, uh, that's not what general anesthesia is. We do have one class of anesthetic agents which do approximate slow wave sleep, and that's dexmedetomidine, all right? And if you've ever done experiments in animals and you use xylazine, it's in the same class of drugs as xylazine, basically. Xylazine, metatomidine, and dexmedetomidine. But, but, but anesthesia itself is, is not sleep. Because you have to have these four characteristics to have general anesthesia. And sleep is, sleep is a physiologic process where you go back and forth between REM and non-REM states. So the drugs have different signatures. You can see them better if you look at the spectrogram. And this is what this is, and, and again, these are not enhanced pictures or anything. It looks just like this in the, in the operating room. And then we can take each one of these examples and go back and do a dissect it and actually say why we get the dynamics that we get by looking at the, the circuitry with modeling studies as well as with you know, neurophys studies and animals and now with our non-human primate model. So I want to tell you a little bit about age. So this is work that I first started doing with Laura Cornelison. She um, is an anesthesiology researcher at Boston Children's Hospital along with Chuck Birdie. And Shuna, Shuna Keiju is our, is, our, is our chair of anesthesiology at Mass General Hospital now. Shung Yun Kim is one of our postdocs. He's not an assistant professor back in, back in Korea. My colleague Patrick Purden, I mentioned just a little while ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so and Patrick Purden is now back at Stanford. Sorry about that. So I just want to show you what happens with age. So that's the 30-year-old. Under We've seen this already. So alpha oscillation, slow delta oscillation. So here is someone who's 57, all right? So he could be, he, this guy here could be this guy's dad, let's say, okay? All right, and, and you can see the, the, the alpha oscillation there, and you see how, this, see how this goes from about 10 to about 15? And so this one goes from about, let's say, 8 to 12. That, that actually is, is a physiologic change we see. The, the alpha power sort of drops down as he gets older. The, the band starts to get lower and lower as we get older, all right? But roughly the same. Here's an 81-year-old, all right? So this is a woman who had a tumor on her chest the size of an American football. It took the thoracic surgeons the better part of six and a half hours to remove it. And I was giving her, so this is where the EEG gets to be really important we were talking about. I was giving her one half, and I'm sorry, one third of the already age-adjusted dose of propofol and keeping her unconscious. And I was able to wake her up on a dime because I was watching her EEG. But look, you can see, here, look up here. There's literally nothing up here in the cognitive space. I mean, and th these are on the these are on the on the decibel scale, and at best extremely weak alpha oscillations. And actually, the best she has is basically slow oscillations. It takes very small amounts of drug to anesthetize older patients. Here's the part that's kind of wild. These two guys here, this guy and this guy, are roughly the same age. His EEG looks like hers. His EEG looks like his. And you first see that, wow, that's kind of weird, right? And you're like, no, no, but think about it. We age different physically. It makes sense that our brains are going to age differently depending on how good or how bad we've been to our brains. Or think of it this way, you know, think of giving anesthesia as a, um, as a neuroscience experiment. You put in a stimulus that makes the, the local field potentials oscillate, essentially. 
And if you have a nice, healthy brain, you know, it's oscillating like this. As it gets older, maybe there's more degeneration, and then it oscillates, you know, like that, all right? But you can guess what the kids look like. So that's a three-year-old, right? That's a 14-year-old, all right? And understanding these differences is important because, you know, pediatric anesthesiologists, they should not be looking for people's brains that look like this. Their brains should look like this, all right? And, and, and actually, it's kind of interesting, you know, as you can see the power basically declines as we get older. And, and just to let you know, the power actually turns out to, this is just an empirical observation. This wasn't something we predicted. The power in the EEG is actually the highest when kids are between six to eight years of age. So you guys can't get smug out there. You're on the downhill slope as well. All right, so the same, the same way. Question? Did you also see like similar power spectrum gene differences in our wake states? You, 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 now, retrospectively, you can see different power changes in patients who are awake, and they've started doing that to get baseline information. But remember, what's happening here is anesthesia is making it easier to see because it's amplifying everything. That, that, that's, that, that's what's occurring here. But the alpha waves are uh, suppressed or just diminished with age. It's they're, just they're, they're definitely diminished with age, no question. And then, and then you can actually infer why that might be the case. You've got a neuron, right? It's been around for 81 years. The myelin sheath breaks down. The, the dendrites don't extend in the tract as much as they used to. You don't produce as much neurotransmitter. The mitochondria aren't as energetic as they used to be. The cell volume declines. So all those things are going to contribute to sort of a decreased ability to transmit an electrical impulse. So d d without invoking anything having to do with dementia or, or you just have some degree of natural neurodegeneration. For the full spectrum, the alpha waves are the way, uh, is this frequency sorry, band. The, what? So for the full spectrum, if you look at the full spectrum, right, of the, mm -hmm. of the waves, the full frequency spectrum, mm -hmm. like the, the, the band of the alpha waves, is this the band that is mostly diminished by age? No, no all the bands are. All the bands, all the bands are. And the thing which I'm going to show you in just a second, I mean, in this woman here, you can see a hint of alpha. For most older patients, you see no alpha whatsoever. Or sometimes you actually see it start off, appear, maybe it's there for about, about 10 minutes or so, and it disappears. So, so but al alpha is, the slow oscillation is always there, but the alpha will, will be gone, for sure. Yeah. Um, one more question about the last slide. Um, I'm curious as to whether an over-administration of propofol would start to result in brain activity that resembles more and more the older patients. Essentially, I think I'm looking at this and I'm wondering if the differences in age is more, uh, it, it shows almost a, a resilience of the circuit to the effects of propofol. And so in my head, I'm wondering then if you were to give more and more propofol, you start to get activity that resembles older and older aged patients. Yeah, well, so, 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 so this is more and more. All right, so, so you can see, I can, if I give you enough, I can make you, make you flatline. So, so, there, so there, there's the more and more. So F basically is birth suppression. And, and there you're just doing this. And so, and as I gave you more and more, you would you totally flatten out and you'd end up in G. So that, that would definitely happen. Well, see, it's not a matter of not giving enough. You, you don't need to be that deep. In other words, you, you don't need to be that unconscious to have your surgery. In other words, that state D that I showed you where you have alpha and slow, alpha and slow together, that's sufficient. If you have just the beta oscillations, you're, you're awake. You're, you're, you're arousable. I, you probably will, will remember some of what's going on. So, and so this is some empiricism which we've, which we've sort of deduced. And we, then we've retrofitted kind of an understanding of why that's the case. But, but if... Um, as you, as you give more and more, you will get to, with, with the GABAergic drugs, you can essentially flatline. So this is what I was about to say. So very young kids, less than three months of age, where we think the thalamus and cortex are not that well connected, they will just produce slow oscillations. Something magical happens at four months of age. I mean, this was amazing. We had these kids who, who, who were, we separated the group from zero to three and then four to six. 
from four to six, they had the, the alpha oscillations and the slow oscillations. The kids who are yet less than three years of age had only the, the slow oscillations. And this is what I was saying before. Older patients typically have just slow oscillations. And there's one other very important case where you have just slow oscillations. It's when you have profound inflammation. The inflammatory mediators actually shut off the arousal centers in the brainstem. This is work which was first shown by Mark Ott, who's a neuroscientist out at University of Washington in Seattle. And <clears throat> we saw a lot of, <clears throat> this is a case of someone who was a drug addict that I was taking care of, who had overwhelming sepsis. If I had to come back to the operating room to have his wound cleaned every couple days. But we saw a lot of this during COVID, all right? And in fact, one of the things I always wondered about was if the inflammation is having a direct effect, when the inflammation clears up, should the alpha oscillations come back, right? And so we actually just published a case report showing that. So we had this young guy whose lungs were totally whited out from his, his, his uh, pneumonia from his COVID. And we, his EEG basically shows just slow oscillations. And we have, we have him over a series of about four days where his lungs are clearing up and his alpha oscillation actually comes back. All right. So empirically suggesting that there, the, uh, this, is pro, this is partially, me, could be mediated by the, by the inflammation. And I just have to tell you about ketamine because ketamine is just, well, ket, ketamine is kind of cool. All right. <laughs> right. You know, right. So um, this is work done by Indy Gar, which is one of my PhD students, and Sir Chakrabarty is one of, one of my postdocs. When you give when you give a low dose of a low dose of ketamine, like the you know ketamine is being used now to treat depression. All right, and they give a low dose. It's a half a milligram per kilogram. So you know, so seventy kilograms you get about thirty five milligrams, and you get it over a span of about mm, forty five minutes to an hour or so. And that's the dose range where people hallucinate. So when I when I dose people in that range, they they will they they they'll they'll tell you they're on a trip. Literally, they'll they'll, they'll say that to you. All right. But I want to show you something. With, with propofol, I showed you how things were just basically slowing down. Look what happens with ketamine. At a low dose of ketamine, what you get is actually a faster oscillation. Right? Here, here's the spectrum up here. It's this part right here. Right? Things actually speed up. And one of the reasons that happens is that for ketamine to work, it actually has to get into, so it's an NMDA antagonist. All right? so, so it's, it's a so glutamate receptors, NMDA glutamate receptors. So it actually has to get into the, into the channel to actually have its effect. So remember, the inhibitory interneurons, there's about one for every about eight or 10 pyramidal neurons, and they act like routers in a computer network. So if you take out the inhibitory interneurons, the pyramidal neurons go, hey, dude, we're free. Let's do stuff. So, so, so they just start spiking like crazy. All right? They're just, they're, so that's why this speeds up. Then once you give a large enough dose, a large enough dose of ketamine, you actually get things to slow down. But there's a whole other statement as to why it goes fast, slow, fast, slow at higher dose. That's something which we're actually working on. We're in the middle of writing a paper about that right now. So I, w I won't comment on the why of it, but I can tell you this is very robust. But this pattern here that you see, this pattern here that you see, this, this is unlike with the propofol. So every four to 10 seconds, it goes from fast to slow, fast to slow. And this is someone who's profoundly unconscious under ketamine. This is something you can operate on. And just to put this into perspective, the World, the World Health Organization has considered ketamine an essential drug. So if you had to go to some remote area to give anesthesia and you could only take one drug with you, you would take ketamine. And the reason is, is because not only does it make you unconscious, see, propofol will only make you unconscious. This will make you unconscious, and it has very po it's a very potent analgesic at the same time. So, so you, could do, you, could do, you could do surgery with just a single drug, and that, if, if that drug were ketamine. And when they had the, um, like several of my colleagues went down to, to Haiti when they had the, the, the earthquake there, and they set up MASH hospitals, MASH tents uh, outside, to operate on, on like the kids. And we'd have an anesthesiologist who would go from, from sort of bed to bed administering ketamine, just uh, t topping up the dose, you know, so the surgeons could basically operate. Because you could do, it with, you can do the surgery with just, just a single drug. So, so ket ketamine is, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's very, very important. I mean, and, I mean, people get high on it and all that sort of thing. It's being used now to treat you know, depression. 
but, but it, it's a very important drug from our standpoint, uh, and I use it all the time when I'm taking care of patients. So last two ideas, closed-loop anesthesia and reanimation. So <clears throat> remember, remember I showed you that, that, that state of anesthesia where it would be flat and then burst, flat and then burst. That's called burst suppression. And very often, when, if a patient comes into the hospital and has um, intractable epilepsy, after they've tried all the, the, the standard drugs and the neurologists, they'll call us up to anesthetize them. And we'll actually put them under general anesthesia to arrest the, to arrest the seizures. And, and that's what a medical coma is. A medical coma is actually turning the, the propofol, the sevoflurane up to a high enough level where you literally essentially shut pretty much everything down. And you, you go to burst suppression, that flat burst, flat burst period. So we thought about 10 years or so ago, it'd be really cool to build a controller to do that because when they're kept in the state of medical coma, it's done for like at least a couple of days, at least 24 hours. And, you know, there were several, you know, very well-known people who had head injuries like Gabrielle Giffords, uh, Michael Schumacher, uh, Malala, and they were placed in medical comas, you know, to help them recover. So it's either to help them recover from trauma or if they have intractable seizure to de decrease you know, sort of brain swelling. So we, we thought we'd build a system like this to test it out on rats. So, so it's very straightforward. So you have a rat that you're measuring EEG on, and you, 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 um, you basically estimate, you set the, you, you, we're going to set a target level of burst suppression that we want to have. Then you, you estimate the level of burst suppression in real time from the EEG. And the difference between where you are and where you want to be changes how much the infusion rate of the, of the drug is, how much you change the infusion rate of the drug. So just a very stamp, standard, simple control system. There's nothing deep about this. We've done it in a number of different ways, PID. Uh, sort of LQR. We've also done model predictive control. But, but here's the thing you're going to be controlling. So this is that state of burst suppression. So you see how you go flat and then burst, flat and then burst. So if I said, in, so let's assume this is one second here. And what I said was, I want you to be 60% suppressed. So that means in the one second you'll have basically roughly two ten four tenths of the time where you're bursting and the rest of the time where you're flat. All right, so that's the target. We do it actually a little bit differently, but that's conceptually what we're up to. So, so, so Miriam did this. Miriam Shinichi did this. This is a video from her work from about 10 years ago. All right. So she's going to set the target first, I think, at 0.4. You'll see the green line come on. So the green line's at 0.4. And the white line in the middle is where the actual controller is. So this is the EEG up here. And this down here is the infusion rate of the pump. So this is the controller working to keep this person right at 0.4. Then she says, well, let's take it up a little higher. Let's take it up to 0.7. So, so it jumps up there to 0.7. And you can see the, the infusion rates change quite a bit and how it achieves that, basically. And you can go even a bit higher on this. I think she takes it up to 0.9. So the point is, this is totally feasible. This isn't, you know, we're using, if you know what marker you want to track, the, the control theory is there. This is literally out of the textbook, you know, type of control theory. It's not, it's, it doesn't require anything sort of really, um, very, very, you know, out of the ordinary. And what I showed you was, I showed you animal two here. See, we're going up, going up, going up. But then what happens is, if you want to go up and you want to come down, I don't have a drug that can decrease the burst suppression. So what the system does is the system, one second, the system turns off right here. Pardon me? What is BSP? Oh, BSP stand. So that's, that's this burst suppression probability. It, it, it's this guy. So it's the fraction of time you're, fraction of time you're suppressed. All right? And that, that's what we're controlling. So you don't, you don't have a way to basically decrease the burst suppression. So the controller just shuts off. It, when, when, when the target drops down, when, you, when the, actual, the actual signal drops down to where the target is, the system starts up again, basically. All right. So this, this is totally feasible. So we did this. This is 10 years old. 
So the FDA said, Emory, that's cute, but you know, you gotta do it in bigger animals. All right, so, so, so we moved to non-human primates. And so the, the same idea, except uh, we have to come up with a different marker to track. Um, and, this is, and this is actually gonna be intracranial data, first of all. This is work Sharish did with, 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 um, with Jake Donahue. So, so MOU stands for marker of unconsciousness. So again, the same idea, you have a target, you have the estimated marker, you feed it into the controller, that changed the infusion rate. And here the update's gonna be every 20 seconds. Before the update was every five seconds in the, in the rats there. All right. Now, I just wanna point out a little bit of science. So th th this is the kind of the key bit of science that went into this, because the controllers, again, it's right out of the textbook. It's nothing fancy. You give an infusion of propofol, and we saw that with the high dose of propofol, the spike rate went down. All right, so we're not gonna be putting electrodes in, but we would eventually measure, we would measure EEG. So, we, so for the moment, let's just measure LFP. So the LFP goes down in lockstep, in the 20 to 30 hertz band, goes down in lockstep with the spike rate. And so if this is what we, what we found out before was associated with the animal being unconscious, and we can sort of see that same effect here, then if we control this, we know we're controlling that. So that's what we're doing, all right? <clears throat> so that's what Sharish did. So he set the marker so it's normalized to be at one, and the first thing he's gonna do is just run a constant infusion. And the reason he's doing that, because that's what we do in the operating room. All, most of the time, we're just running a constant infusion. We have no controllers or anything like that. So watch what happens. I'll just play this. And so he's gonna do that for a little under 40, 40 minutes. So the marker, it's supposed to be at one, it's wandering all over the place. You can see in, in the second, in the second, see this panel here, see this is all constant. But the marker, instead of staying at one, is running all over the place. And now the controller f turns on and it locks it in at one. Now he's gonna drop it a little bit deeper so lower, lower number means a deeper state of anesthesia, so that's 0.9. Now we'll take it up to a higher level, a little less, of, I think like 0.1.1. 1, 1. 1. 1. 1. All right, so totally feasible. Not surprising, it's totally feasible once you have the right thing to control. So the science is in getting the right thing to control. I just want to point out one thing which is important to realize because Th th this, little, this gives you some insight as to what happens in the operating room. This is me in the operating room typically. I'm running a constant infusion. With that constant infusion, my patient just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So this is what's happening to patients in the operating room now. And what does the controller do? The controller says, you're too deep. I'm going to shut off for three minutes. It actually shuts down for three minutes. Then once the marker gets back, where well, the actual marker gets back up to the target, it then turns on again. All right. So you can so imagine the OR, but patients in the ICU, whether where like the the COVID patients who are sedated for literally days, this would be huge. So this is something that we're, we're actively working on. All right. And one final thing: we give you drugs to make you unconscious and to keep you unconscious. We don't turn the brain back on. But why not turn the brain back on? So this is work my colleague Ken Saltz has been doing for about 10 years or so now. And this is a rat that's anesthetized with propofol. He's got a propofol infusion running in his tail vein. And Ken has an electrode stuck in his ventral tegmental area. The ventral tegmental area is at the top of the brainstem in the midbrain, and it's an arousal pathway. It's a dopaminergic arousal pathway. So what he's going to do is he's going to stimulate this guy's VTA while he's under propofol anesthesia. So look right here. Watch right there. You're going to see when he turns the stimulation on, he's going to start breathing like crazy. Turns it on. So he starts breathing. The propofol is still running. And he says, look, Ken, I'm out of here. All right, all right. So what, what's Ken doing? So here's the VTA. Remember, this is the meso midbrain, so the midbrain here, cortical pathway. And you can do this with Ritalin also, so we've done this with Ritalin. And it goes through the limbic system, past the hippocampus nucleus accumbens, up the, and this is a dopaminergic pathway. So what Ken is doing, he's stimulating here, this is electrical stimulation, but we've also done it optogenetically. 
And so we actually think that something like Ritalin or amphetamines could be given at the end of a case to turn someone's brain back on. And this is conceptually different from what happens like with opioids. So here you have an opioid, and the opioid uh, binds to an opioid receptor. And then you give naloxone, and naloxone has a higher affinity for the receptor than the opioid, so it, 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 it pushes the opioid off. And that's how you reduce the effect of the opioid. But this is conceptually different. So you have a pyramidal neuron sitting here like this. You have inhibition coming this way, which is enhanced by your GABAergic anesthetic. So it actually, it, it actually helps shut down this pyramidal neuron. But this pyramidal neuron also gets excitatory inputs. So now we're going to drive the excitatory inputs more than the inhibitory inputs as we turn the inhibitory inputs off to bring the pyramidal, bring the pyramidal neuron back on. So that's conceptually how we're, how we're thinking about it. So something in this space will work, but this is one of the ways we think we can get beyond this whole idea of brain dysfunction after anesthesia. So this is what I've just shown you. I've given you some idea about how the drugs work by creating these oscillations, how we can use the, the oscillations to monitor the, the brain. Again, very easy to see in the EEG, very strong signal, how it changes the anesthetic class, how it changes the age. Reanimation is something that we should be doing, actively turning the brain back on. And I think it's the way it's going to help. Post-operative brain dysfunction happens in a very large fraction of older patients, you know, 20 to 40 percent, depending upon which study you want to listen to or, 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 or report. And, <clears throat> and actually, this is the anesthesiologist's view of clinical neuroscience. We're in the middle, and everything rotates around us. There are all these, but there are all these cool links between anesthesia and all these other fields of neuroscience that are underexploited and, and not, not, not used. I'll just, I'll just tell you about two of them. So you've heard a lot about how anesthesia is used to treat depression. Excuse me, how ketamine is used to treat depression. It turns out that there are actually studies out there which show that pretty much any of the anesthetics can be used to treat depression. And that's just a fascinating question as to why that would be the case, right? Or, for example, as I mentioned, we have anesthetics which better approximate sleep than the current drugs on the market. If you call the current drugs weak anesthetics or sedatives as opposed to sleeping aids, that's a much more accurate statement. Because they themselves don't induce sleep. What they do is they induce sedation, and hopefully your, your sleep mechanism, the natural ones, will take over. All right? So there's a lot of things which we can learn from, which I think the ways in which anesthesiology taken seriously from a neuroscience perspective, contribute to clinical neuroscience so we can have a much more robust discourse, you know, scientifically. And part of it, the reason it doesn't happen is because, again, what's the first thing I told you about? We walk around saying, we have no idea how it works. So we can't even begin to engage in this conversation. So, but once we think more about this from a neuroscience standpoint, I think there are a lot of possibilities here. And most importantly, it's going to help patients. So I'll stop there. Thanks, guys.